Well, shalom and blessings, family. Welcome to Voice of Messiah Ministries. Just wanted to uh, greet you all in the mighty name of Messiah, Yahshua, uh, out here in the state of Canada, vacationing, but led of the Most High to uh, share with you something that was on my heart from the scriptures. I was reading in a passage a few days ago, and uh, it got my attention. Um, with regard to Messiah and his uh, challenge to those who regard themselves as being a part of his family. Uh, there were a whole lot of things that Messiah said as it had to do with challenging people to come to him, to follow him, to be saved. And, you know, in uh, this uh, 21st century, uh, there are a number of uh, ways in which we have uh, chosen to understand the concept of the good news or the besorah. The Hebrew word besora is the term actually used in Hebrew for uh, the message regarding salvation. Uh, many have the idea that all you have to do is just believe uh, on the name of Yahshua and you'll be saved. Uh, and in uh, their understanding of believing, it just simply means a verbal and an intellectual assent that he died, rose again, and is the Savior, and he lives. But uh, outside of that, there really is nothing else that you need to do because grace covers it all. And, uh, you know, much of that thinking that is understood by modern Christianity today in our world primarily comes from a Greek and Roman thought base when it comes to looking at the scriptures. But before I go any further into that, I want to delve into this passage because this is one of those statements that Messiah makes that really brings it to home as it has to do with being in the family of Elohim. So let's go to the book of Luke. I'm in Luke and we're in the eighth chapter and we're going to look at verses 19 through 21. So if you have a Bible, you can get it, look at it. If you're here with me and you're watching this, Luke chapter 8 verses 19 through 21. And this is what it says. His mother and his brothers brethren or family members actually it was his brothers and sisters and, and his mother that were there it says they were looking for him but they could not get into him because of the crowd he was told your mother and brothers are standing outside and want to see you but he said in answer my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of Elohim and put it into practice. Now, this is an interesting response that our Messiah gave. You know, here it is. He has his mother and his brothers and sisters. They are in the midst of the multitude of people. You know, Messiah is, you know, at one of those uh, sessions where he's teaching and he's preaching. And those of his family, his, his, his immediate family, his mother, his brothers, sisters, wanted to come in and they wanted to, um, you know, uh, be a part of what was going on and actually be able to see him. And so uh, his response was, my mother and my brothers, my sisters or my family are those who hear the word of Elohim and practice it. Wow, this is a very powerful statement because what we find here is that being in the family or considered as being part of the family of Messiah requires not just simple belief, not just hearing the scriptures and saying, yeah, I believe it's true or yeah, I believe it's correct, but as Messiah, the incarnate Elohim in the flesh that came to us here on earth. He said that those who are part of my family 
are those who not only hear the word of Elohim, but also practice it. Now, what this indicates here is this idea that was understood in the ancient time when it came to how a person in the Hebrew culture understood believing. See, within Hebrew culture, if you said you believed in something, it meant that you put forth an action to solidify your belief. See, belief wasn't just saying, uh, I believe this, or I believe that, or I believe this is true. When you declare that you have a faith, a belief in something, what it indicated is that it was something that was going to now change your life radically. If you believed in something, it had an effect upon everything that had to do with your life. So you couldn't separate faith or belief from action. That's why Yaakov or James commonly called in the book of James, his name is Yaakov, but James, he said that faith without works is dead. And see, those who lived in the first century understood that faith was always associated with some type of action. And so a person who said they believed that Yahshua was the Messiah, what that meant was that they were going to now modify, adjust their whole life now to the teaching and to the way of the Messiah. It wasn't just a verbal declaration. It wasn't just some mental agreement that I believe that he is the one that the father has sent. But it meant that now you were going to be affected radically and there would be things that you were going to do and change so that your life would be accommodated to all that the Messiah had to say and bring forth. Now, what's interesting here, and I notice, seeing that Messiah made this statement back in the first century, and when he talked about those who heard the word of Elohim and practiced the word of Elohim, Yahshua wasn't just talking about some of the commandments that people were to follow and eliminating other commandments. Because in this modern Christian age, what we have is a belief system that says that there are some commandments that are given only for quote unquote the Jews and then there are a certain uh, set of commandments that are given for the rest of the human race. So you ask yourself, where did this idea come from of separating certain commandments for certain people groups and other commandments for other people groups. Where did that concept come from? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself that question? You know, those who might be watching, you, you might not uh, understand, but in Bible college and in seminary, and those who know about Bible college and seminary, we have been taught in our theological training that when you approach the Bible, what you have to understand is that the Bible has been broken up into three sections when you deal with what's called the law. It's broken up into what's called the moral law, the civil law, and ceremonial law. Now, these are the concepts that have been presented to us who have been trained theologically in seminaries and in Bible colleges and universities all over the country and no doubt around the world by those who call themselves Christians. But the thing that we don't take into account is that all of these 
seminaries and Bible colleges and centers of theological learning are all rooted in the Western Roman, Greco-Roman understanding of the Christian faith. And what they don't tell you is that this idea, what is actually called compartmentalization of the scriptures, this idea of compartmentalization was something that the fourth century church created. Now you say, where are you going with this mode? Where are you going with this? I'm, I want to help us to understand the basis of understanding the thought process in how we now see and perceive the scriptures. There's many of us, we just take at face value that, oh, this idea of seeing the scriptures as being broken up into these, or shall I say, the, the, the law per se, which literally is Torah. But if we see the Torah, the commandments, as being broken up into three compartments, then what we have now is a section that can only be applied to non-Hebrews, and then there's a section that is applied only to Hebrews. And now we can now teach and preach that certain commandments in the scriptures are not for the quote-unquote Gentiles. This whole concept was developed by the 4th century church, a.k.a. the Roman Catholic Church. I like to call it the Greco-Roman Western uh, system of the church. They were the ones who came up with this concept that the law and the commandments are to be divided up into three compartments, moral law, civil law, ceremonial law. The moral law applies to all human beings. The civil law applies to the lifestyle within the nation of Israel. And the ceremonial law applies to the temple service that the Levites performed. And since there's no more temple, there's no more ceremonial law. And since there's no more quote unquote established nation of Israel, there's no more civil law. But now we have the moral law. And by the way, the Sabbath is not a part of that moral law. So, you know, one day I asked myself the question some years ago, asked myself the question, did Messiah and the apostles view the scriptures the way I was trained in seminary. I had to ask myself that question. And what I discovered was absolutely not. As a matter of fact, Messiah and the apostles, being Israelites, understood the scriptures, the Torah, which has been translated as being law, but it doesn't mean law. Torah literally means teachings, statutes is the word for law in Hebrew. But the term Torah means the teachings, the precepts, the instructions of the Almighty. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? And so when we look at the teachings, all of the commandments are regarded as Torah or teachings. The word Torah literally means to point to instruct it has to do with the principles that guide in the way of righteousness that's what torah is and so messiah and his apostles during their time saw the torah as one whole unit the concept of compartmentalization had no place in the idea mindset or even thought of those Israelites of the first century. That idea didn't come about until another roughly 200 to 300, 400 years later downstream when they began to break away from the original Hebraic roots and foundations of the Messianic Israelite faith. So what we find here, what did Messiah believe? They believed that the scriptures were one unit that they were all one that's why in the passage it says when you break one of the commandments you break them all because they saw the scriptures as one whole unit 
Another thing I want to bring about has to do with the fact that um, the commandments were not given initially to Moses. You might say, oh, no, no, no. You being a heretic now, Mo, you, 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 you talking out the side of your neck. Listen to me. The commandments of the Most High were given to Adam and known by Adam and all of the patriarchs from Adam to Seth going down to Noah. They all knew the commandments of the Most High. You say, well, I don't find anything saying that they were keeping the Sabbath before it was given to Moses. Well, one of the things that I want you to know is that if you if you have the guts enough to go and read some of the other books that were not compiled in the canon that we have, because the canon of scriptures that we have was composed by the fourth century Greco-Roman church that just picked and choose which ones they wanted. But the first century believers used the book of Enoch. They also had a book called the book of Yasher, which was which is uh, noted in Joshua, Joshua. And also uh, one of the other books notes the book of Yasher that was used and available. Matter of fact, one of the Eastern, uh, or shall I say Orthodox churches, the Orthodox church in Ethiopia, in their canon of scripture, they have all of the books that were used by the first century believers, and they did not remove any of those books. But the Western branch of the church removed certain books because they they were in all actuality some of those books were actually incriminating because of the prophecies that were noted about the roman church system and their meshing of paganism that they had brought into the faith but going back to the actual uh, scriptures that were used by the first century believers they had the book of Enoch, they had the book of Yashur, and in those books it records information about the Sabbath and information about other commandments that were being kept. Well, you can go and look in the book of Bereshit, Genesis, if you want to find out something about clean and unclean, Noah already knew about the distinction between clean and unclean animals because it tells us that when he got off of the ark, it says that he prepared a sacrifice for Yahuwah, the most high of all clean animals. And he was told by the Almighty that when you bring the animals into the boat, he said, you bring only a pair, male and female, of the unclean animals, but you bring seven pairs of the clean animals on the ark. Now, that right there is an the evidence that they knew the difference between the clean and the unclean. See, they already had the commandments. They knew the commandments of the Most High, but as a result of their falling away and worshiping the angels that came down and cohabitated with the women and produced giants, they had developed an idolatrous system of worship that carried over after the flood in the days of Nimrod. Well, he brought that system back to emergence and began teaching and practicing the pagan idolatrous system. And they forgot the commands and teachings of the Almighty, the Most High, Yahuwah, Eloheinu, our Elohim. So the Torah was already in the earth before Moses. When the Most High gave the Torah to Moses, he was reinstituting the Torah and putting it on tables of stone to now make a people who he called his own accountable and to be the custodians of his truth in the earth. But the Torah itself had already been given. So I said all of that to say this. Messiah and the apostles, when they were talking about 
the word of Elohim. When Yahshua said that those who are part of my family are those who hear the word of Elohim and practice it. He was talking about the practicing of all of the mitzvot, every last commandment, because they saw it as one whole unit. And let me inform you that when Mashiach comes, when our Messiah comes, when he returns and he establishes his seat of authority in Yerushalayim and he sits upon his throne and governs the entire planet where we will rule and reign with him, every individual, every subject will be under the authority of the Messiah and the Torah. You read over in Isaiah, Isaiah second chapter, it says about this mountain of the house of Yahuwah that will be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above all the hills and all nations will flow to it. And it says that they will come and be taught the Torah for out of Zion, Zion shall go forth the word of Yahuwah. It's what it says. All of it will be taught when the Messiah returns. And so when Messiah is talking about those who hear the word of Yahuwah, that hear the Devar Elohim, the word of Elohim, when they hear it and practice it, those are regarded as being my family. So I want to challenge you that are listening today. I want to challenge you to hear the word of Messiah. See, this was how he understood it. This was how the first century believers understood it. And those of you who are right there on the fence of, of deciding whether you're going to um, give your life to Messiah, understand this that he loves you with everything, but his challenge is, is a strong challenge. It's not an easy challenge. You know, we preach this message of salvation and it's such a watered down message that we preach today. Many of us, not myself, but many of us that declare to be preachers of it because we tell people that all you need to do is believe and nothing else. But we do not challenge them with the words of Messiah. Messiah said that if you come after me, he said, let that person deny himself that means messiah challenges you to strip yourself of what you want to do and how you want to live deny yourself take up your cross in other words you're going to now burden yourself with the cross and follow me messiah said that whosoever shall save his life shall lose it in other words it's not about you anymore. He challenges you to give up everything about what you want to do and to follow him. He says, you've got to sell out and follow him. Messiah made the statement and he said, unless you repent. Now, I don't know if any of you really know what the word repent means because Yahshua was not speaking Greek when he was walking the earth. He was speaking the Aramaic form of Hebrew when he walked the earth and he used the word called Teshuvah. Teshuvah is not something that you do with your mind. You know, we looked at the Greek word for repentance. And I remember when when I was, uh, you know, studying and looking at the Greek words and, you know, thinking, oh, if I could just know the Greek words, you know, I can teach the scriptures right. Didn't know that the Greek was actually preserving Hebrew concepts. But the, the word in Greek that's translated repentance doesn't do justice to the actual word that Messiah stated when he walked the earth where he said that you need to do teshuvah. Teshuvah is something that you do, is something you perform. It is a word which indicates returning to the creator. 
When you return to the creator, you turn your back on paganism, you turn your back on the world, you turn your back on sin. It is a it is a voluntary moving towards the most high based upon the already established conviction or being convinced that sin is wrong and that sin is rebellion against the most high and that you are turning your back on the lifestyle that is in opposition to the things of the most high and you are walking towards the creator you're returning to him messiah used this word he said unless you perform teshuvah you shall in no wise enter the kingdom you'll perish See, this is the challenge that Messiah gave in hearing the word and practicing it. And I challenge each one of you that might be listening today, not just to hear this, but to receive it and then practice it and receive every blessing that comes from the Most High because you have chosen to do what the Messiah says. See, the only way we can be a part of the family of the Most High it's not by taking a few scriptures that we get, as some say, going down the Romans road, you know, where we get our few scriptures in Romans 10, 9 and 10 and tell people that all you got to do is just believe. You don't have to do anything else. You say by grace. What we don't realize is that it was the grace or the mercy, the chayim, the loving kindness, the hedging in of the almighty that produced the salvation. But in order to receive that salvation and that atonement, you have to do something. Messiah said you have to perform teshuva. Any preacher that tells you you don't have to do anything obviously has not read the word that Messiah declared and preached. Messiah said you've got to give up your life. Messiah said you must return to the Father. Messiah said you must take up the cross. Messiah said you must deny yourself. Yes, there is something you must do in order to receive salvation based upon the words of our Messiah. I tell you, he wants every human being to be a part of his family. But the statement that Messiah made here in Luke chapter 8, as we had read, let me go back to that real quick because I just want to highlight that real quick as I wrap this up. But in that 21st verse, he said, my mother, my brothers are those who hear the word of Elohim and practice it. Hearing the word of Elohim produces faith and faith moves you to action. And when you come into Messiah and receive the salvation, it doesn't stop there because salvation brings us into the covenant relationship, binding us to the Father that we might live before him in obedience. You wanna be a part of the family? Do what the Messiah said here in this verse. And he will bless your life tremendously. We love each and every one of you and thank you for listening to us and hearing us today on Voice of Messiah Ministries. Be blessed. Shalom. Shalom to each and every one of you.